representatives and state senators. State senators and representatives here. Um, I, I looked at all their bios. They're very different people from very different backgrounds. But what I, what I noticed that they had in common was a huge desire to be of service. Every single one of these individuals started out when they were very young to be of service, but it was joining the military or, or volunteering for AmeriCorps or whatever it is. They started early and they have never changed their mind. Uh, Margaret Mead, when she got old, she looked a little cranky. She, somebody asked her, what, what should I do? What's the meaning of, of, of life activity? And she said, be of some use. <laughs> be of some use. And we have four people here who have made themselves of some use. And so welcome. <laughs> you, Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having us here. It's nice to drive up and be a little cooler than in uh, I'm, I'm Senator Katie Hobbs. I represent uh, Central Phoenix and South Scottsdale District uh, 24. And uh, this is my second term in the legislature. I was elected to the House in 2010. And uh, ran for the Open State Senate. Thank you guys, my name is Martin Quesada. First, I, I want to thank uh, uh, DORR, -DOR. I want to thank you guys for organizing this. This is great that you put this together and invited the community out to have a chance to, to meet with, with their elected officials. So I think you guys deserve a lot of credit for that. And also the Jewish Community Center for hosting us. Uh, that's always a, a task as well. So thank you guys for doing that. And uh, anyone that brought food, thank you. <laughs> they probably spent the morning preparing that or going and picking it up somewhere. But thank you. Uh, and it's great to be here in Sedona. Uh, I don't get a chance to come up here very often, but when I do, I always thoroughly enjoy it. It's a beautiful place, and I can completely understand why you all live up here. Um, so again, my name is Martin Casala. I uh, am serving in my second term as well in the House of Representatives. I was appointed to a vacant seat uh, in, in 2012, uh, and, and the district I represent now is District 29, which is the west part of Phoenix. Uh, uh, part of town called Marydale, and I also uh, have uh, parts of South and West Glendale. Uh, a lot of people, and, and a small part of the, the city of Litchfield Park. A lot of people uh, uh, find my district because the uh, Arizona Cardinal Stadium is right in the middle of my district. <laughs> so uh, that's usually how I describe to people if that doesn't make sense when I tell them the, the other areas. I say, I'm where the stadium's at, and that's how they find me. Uh, I serve on, on three committees in the House. Uh, I am the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, and I'm the ranking Democrat on the Government Committee, and I also serve on the Rules Committee. Um, uh, and, and those fit well with my background as well. I'm, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing law for the past five years now. Uh, and, uh, and I also serve uh, in, a, in an elected position on the Pendergast Elementary School, school Board. Uh, so I'm a school board member out in the West Valley as well. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm again, happy to be here. Um, good afternoon, thank you. I'm very honored to be um, have been invited here by uh, the Democratic Party of the Red Rocks. My name is James Sita May Peshlakai. I am Navajo and I'm a local of Northern Arizona and um, my district is District 7, which is northeast of here, and it's the largest district in the United States, and the largest in Arizona. It includes the full one northeast quarter of our state. I am Navajo. I'm a traditional Navajo. I'm a veteran of the Persian Gulf War. I served in the military eight years, U.S. Army, and I am a mother. Um, and let's see, Democrat. <laughs> I have a list. <laughs> I've had a long weekend. Um, I have my bachelor's and uh, bachelor's degree in history and philosophy from NAU, master's in educational psychology from NAU, and I'm working on getting my doctorate degree from NAU. So I've been a long, 
well trained by NAU. <laughs> so uh, this is my first year at the state legislature. I'm um, this is my freshman year, and I'm serving with my um, seatmates, Representative Albert Hale and Senator Jack Jackson, both Navajos, both Democrats. And um, I serve on the Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee, and also the Public Safety, Military, and Regulatory Affairs. And I consider myself a local of Sedona. I'm one of those little kids that grew up selling beadwork in Sedona, <laughs> and also dancing and um, entertaining tourists. So that's where I get my um, skills as a diplomat. <laughs> and bonjour, Angela. I speak French, not fluently, but I do speak some um, different languages. But um, this is, as my father always says, he says, welcome to the Navajo Indian country and northern Arizona. So I've been here and there, and I've been um, a mother and I'm involved in the tourist, tourist um, industry and education. And uh, I think my, my work here at the legislature has been um, because I care very much about the future of my children and all our children. So um, when it came time through the redistricting, we were looking in the crowd up in northern Arizona and saying, who can we send? And, and then I thought, you know what, I, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I go with many of the prayers and faith and the blessings of my people. I'm not very happy to be here in Arizona, in Arizona, and Arizona, um, and I'm happy to be amongst you here this evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how happy I am to be up here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry? A louder, please. Yes, of course. Is this better? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm Representative Stephanie Mock. I come from Tucson. Uh, it's District 10, and that's the um, central east portion of, of Tucson. Uh, it starts at the university and goes out to the Saguaro uh, National Park. It goes up partway to Mount Lemon, um, just to give you a little background. It is one of the most um, competitive districts in the state. And uh, after redistricting, so I'm really proud to have won uh, in that competitive district. Uh, I serve on the Appropriations and Commerce Committees, um, uh, which is going to be interesting this week <laughs> because we're really getting into the budget this week. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to know that we're rolling on that. Um, I, I serve on those committees partially because I am a small business owner. I work as a consultant for nonprofits, um, which is what I've done primarily over the last decade of my life. Um, I've worked in nonprofits mostly because um, I wanted to give back to my communities um, wherever I lived. I'm a military kid. I grew up uh, having service in my bones. You know, you do things right and you do things because they're important to do. Um, and, and I was raised that way. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I like to tell people in my district um, one of the best ways you, you get to know a little bit about me and my raising is, you know, I, when I told my parents I was going to run. Uh, my mom was very ecstatic and really supportive, of course. And my dad, uh, you know, I, I offhandedly said, hey, are you, so would you vote for me? And, <laughs> and he's like, well, it depends <laughs> on uh, what, you're, what you're running for, what, what, you, what you plan to do there. So it never has been about uh, the association, associations you have or about what you uh, think you are, it's about what you do and what you're going to do. And um, that, that's very important to me. Um, and I think that you're right, it, we are doing the right thing. We're fighting for people who, who don't have a voice up there um, in, in the capital. And I think that as we get more and more numbers, we'll be able to better represent everybody in the state and not just the most fortunate. Um, but uh, again, I'm a, I'm a business owner, so I do care about the economy. I do care very deeply about making sure that people have access to, to starting their own businesses and, and supporting their own families. But we need to make sure that we can help them along the way to that, to that path. So uh, again, uh, as I started, I'm just so happy to be here. It's been uh, a beautiful drive in. The temperature is amazing. You all are very Yes, yes, comparatively, yes. Um, but 
Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the questions, and um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Mike Cosentino. I'm the co-host on Democratic Perspectives, and uh, and uh, they uh, they allow me to serve on the board of Democrats of the Red Rocks. But um, uh, they're always afraid of exactly what I'm going to say when they invite me to these things. But I do want to say this: that that uh, if you haven't read Lori Roberts' May 28th column on the Arizona Legislature, if you came here today, you know, not fully prepared, or you've heard all of the things that are you know, little bits and pieces about what happens down there. Uh, uh, Roberts certainly gave a great perspective in her columns. You might want, it's on the back of, of the, uh, the names and addresses, the handout that's flying around the room here uh, that, that, that has the names and addresses of our representatives, the people from this district, the legislators from this district. Uh, our topics are education, health care, and the environment. Um, I have the education and the other question. We have other, uh, and it seems like the other are kind of all falling into the voting rights category because that certainly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was under attack by the 2013 legislature. They're making it harder to vote rather than opening up uh, uh, Arizona to be a little more free, a little more democratic. So, uh, yeah, do you want to go ahead and start there, Mr. Williamson? <coughs> probably got a lot of uh, cards on this and do you have a reason to believe that the Medicare expansion will pass the legislature? Yeah, so the question is really, yeah, I yeah, oh, sorry folks, the question is is about whether the Medicare, uh, Medicaid will be extended by the legislature. It's a very important issue and uh, the governor and very, very conservative members of the legislature are in disagreement and, and so the question I have is, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that we'll get an extension of Medicaid to help all these people or not? Uh, yes, it, it will happen. It's not going to be pretty, but it'll happen. So, so what's happened so far is that um, the Senate has passed the our version of the budget, which includes a Medicaid expansion. Um, we had a coalition of the 13 Senate Democrats and five Republicans um, who support Medicaid expansion. We worked out some agreements with them on changes to the budget that we wanted in there. And um, we're able to vote out a budget that is not the best budget in the world, but certainly much better than we've seen in the last uh, several years. And it included Medicaid expansion. So those bills were sent over to the House um, April 16th, I believe. April? May 16th, yeah. Oh, all right, happy birthday. Um, so, um, so it seems like a really long time ago. But, um, and so, so I think, so the House, and, and these folks, especially, um, I think Stephanie's not a probe school to talk about this, but the, the, um, the budget bills barely got read and assigned to committee in the House. Um, I think Tobin's trying to figure out what's the best option for him, because there is also a coalition of eight or nine or ten Republicans plus the, the 24 Democrats in the House that will get this done in the House as well. But I believe that the Appropriations Committee is going to kill the health um, the health budget bill, and they'll have to pull some procedural maneuvers on the floor to resurrect that. Um, but I, I believe it'll get done. I believe if the governor doesn't get a budget that includes Medicaid expansion, the budget will be vetoed, and we'll keep going back until it, it happens. And we saw that in 2009 with the, with the um, Prop 100 vote. Um, nobody wanted it to happen, and it got done, and so it, it'll happen. I don't know if anyone wants to add. Um, yeah, I think that I think the case is right. Uh, we have an appropriations meeting tomorrow that's going to be discussing these two, the, the this debate exactly, and um, what they're going to try to do is uh, kill it, or they're going to add uh, two amendments that have been proposed. One concerning abortion language. Um, the two parts of that abortion language have, have already been introduced and struck down in courts uh, very recently in the state. Um, one, one of those was in the late 90s and then one uh, somewhat more recent. So uh, the language is just asking for more litigation in our state uh, because it's, it's been proven to be against the law. So I think that you do have um, the eight, um, possibly more. Uh, there's been eight dedicated people who are saying they are absolutely going to vote for 
Medgate expansion on the Republican side. And I really have to say, I, I, I congratulate those people and I want you all to support them um, in this. I know it's a hard decision for them and their constituents. And they're doing it because it's the right thing, not only for people uh, morally, but, but also it's a, it's a numbers game. It's truly going to affect our hospitals and our clinics and um, the very people who are employing people with very good jobs in the state. So um, they recognize that. They're, they're going to be dedicated to doing that. But again, it's uh, well, like Katie said, it's a procedural thing that we're going to have to, um, of the 11 people on the Appropriations Committee, uh, only four of us are Democrats, and not one of them belong to that eight. So it, it will be killed, if you will, or are altered in a way that's not going to be favorable to us. But again, we will do it on the floor. I think that we all recognize it. Chambers of Commerce are behind it. Many businesses, many typically conservative people have come out saying, listen, the numbers don't lie. This is what for us to do. So I really do believe it about them. Yeah, I, I just I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Howie Fisher, uh, 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 as a former journalist, I find Howie Fisher to be incredibly effective. He runs a thing called Capital Media Services. He says that the abortion thing in the health care uh, extension, the Medicaid extension, is all about giving the Republicans cover. Uh, nobody actually believes that there, anybody could confuse the language in the current legislation. But it's all about trying to give those Republicans that want to vote for it cover. And, um, and that's part of why it's being dragged out is so we can give uh, a fight over language gives some Republicans that want to vote for it some cover. And that the explanation goes longer than that. I'm gonna I got some education questions here. I want to make sure that uh, and this is a this is a tough question. I think because unless you're prepared for it, could you provide some statistics on education in Arizona? For example, how does Arizona compare to other states in student success, uh, graduation rates? Uh, uh, how does education, uh, how has education been offered, uh, been affected, I can read this, but affected by the economic downturn? Uh, have classroom sizes been affected? What programs have been cut and which uh, which areas of the state have been hit the hardest? I, I am the writer complaining about my reading of this? No. Okay. Well, I had a lot of questions there. If you need anything repeated, uh, ask Stephanie. No. Uh, that's, that's the teacher's name. You just give it away. Um, I'll take the easiest parts of that. And <laughs> um, we, we don't have uh, the best graduation rate. Uh, I think it's somewhere around 75%. Um, so that means a quarter of the people in, in Arizona are not graduating with a high school degree, which leads to uh, over a million dollars, roughly, of loss in, of, of revenue of your personal income over a period of your life. And each degree, it goes up, uh, I don't know by how many degrees. So it's very important that we make sure that we increase those graduation rates. And obviously, there are certain districts that just have uh, a worse graduation rate and some that have better for reasons of inequity. Um, mostly. Um, other statistics, you know, some of the programs that have been taken away, we have about uh, over $2 billion taken away from education in the last several years. It's a massive cut. The universities have received it all the way down through uh, full day kindergarten is not available uh, throughout the state. There's a block grant, a ch young children's early childhood education block grant that was taken away. Um, those who graduate with the best grades used to get scholarship through school that no longer is available. We have, um, there's, there's a myriad of programs, JTED programs, the Joint Technical Education Degree pr programs that provide very good uh, technical education have been cut, at, particularly at the ninth grade level in, uh, in my district in particular. Um, so that there are a lot of serious effects. Yes, the classroom sizes have gone up. Um, and, and we continue to undermine the programs. And even this year in the budget, it's proposed that we don't have um, uh, the, the, the formula that increases the amount of education to, only to hold steady with what we were in 2008. So uh, we, we are looking towards uh, a structural education problem in our state if we don't reverse the trend. Um, so I'm gonna let everyone else sort of give more statistics if they have them, but um, it's a very, Big problem. In addition to that, Common Core is a new standard that we have to 
um, hold up to so that we make sure that we're on, on the same standard as everyone else in the rest of the country. And uh, we do not have enough funding in our budget to cover the costs of training our teachers to do an appropriate job for that. Um, so, so we're trying. We're doing our best to, to give some money, but there are no raises for teachers. Um, there, there are things that we definitely need to look forward to in the next coming budgets that, that we should really, really work on for education. Uh, I'll, I'll address this a little bit as well. Um, the reality is that uh, our public schools are suffering. Uh, and it's, it's as a result of the, the funding priorities that our, leg our legislature has made over the last several years. Uh, I serve on a school board as well, as I mentioned earlier, and I see a lot of this firsthand uh, when we're developing our own budget for our schools. I don't know if there are any educators here in the room, but uh, uh, our, our, our teachers are, are suffering. They haven't been given raises uh, th throughout the state for some, for as many as five, six, seven years since they've had a raise. And these are individuals that are already making a significantly lower uh, uh, rate than they probably should be if they were doing some other work uh, granted the workload that they take on, education that, they're, that, that they've received. Uh, and, and, and many districts simply cannot afford to pay them what they really need and, and deserve uh, for that work. Um, in, in the budget that the Senate just adopted and that we're, we're about to consider in the House, uh, we did uh, provide an, an additional $82 million that would fund What's, what's, what's called the, the inflation rate, which is a statutory formula that we as a state have, are supposed to have been funding for many, many years. We haven't funded that for many years. There was a lawsuit that went all the way up to the Arizona Court of Appeals that said you must fund that as a matter of, of, of law. And so we did fund that this year. And so a lot of people will say that this is a great thing, we're getting an extra 82 million. But the reality of that situation is that 82 million, we're not getting a, a single dollar above that. So what's going to happen is that, that 82 million is going to be used by the districts to, pro to try to give those teachers some raises, to try to retain some of those teachers. Every district is losing teachers every day, every month, every year. We're losing good educators, and our children are suffering for that. So most districts, my prediction, they will use that, that funding to give some teachers raises and try to retain some of that, that personnel. So when that money is used in that sense, what is, what is not going to be funded? Uh, implementation of the Common Core, which is a huge, a huge cost to each of our districts as well. And that is very important because this, these are new models that all of our schools are adopting and we are not funding that. So we're, we're giving uh, uh, schools a lot of things that they need to get done and we're giving them no way to fund it. So this Common Core implementation is going in starting next year. Uh, they're not going to be able to fund it. Most districts, I can tell you, are in desperate need of technology to implement this because a lot of the testing is done online now rather than on pen and paper, and we simply don't have the computers that are able to withstand uh, that that type of, uh, of, of of technology that's needed to to give these tests. So our schools are going to be in a real tough situation right now, knowing that they have to test kids on a, on a new a new standards and not having any way to get that done. Uh, so our, our schools are in, are in a lot of trouble. Um, but uh, I know that we've been fighting down at the legislature, me and my colleagues here, for, for that increased funding because this really should be one of our main priorities at the legislature. Marty, why don't people raise your hand if you're former educators, educators, educational administrators? Do you want to know how many? That's <laughs> Thank you, folks. I just, add, sure. I just want to add to that, um, in addition to all the attacks on public education, Arizona is really a petri dish for school choice in our country. And the way that we have gone about implementing uh, school choice options has really created a, 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 a hugely unlevel playing field. And so at the same time that we continue to attack public education, we pull resources and give it to these other um, private and charter schools, um, which don't have to play by the same rules as the public schools. And so they're, they don't have the same accountability to state regulations, to federal regulations, um, and they're getting our tax dollars to, to educate our kids. And, um, and uh, so that's just another kind of, um, I guess, layer in this whole public school um, kind of conundrum that we're in in our state in terms of performance and um, and funding and where the where the money is going and um, we have probably the most generous um, 
it's a voucher program. They called it something else to get around the voucher issue, but um, tuition tax credits. And so you can, um, you know, give a donation to a private school tuition organization, and then write that directly off on your taxes up to a, a huge amount. It's it's a huge, and and you can do it personally, but corporations have this much higher cap that they can write off. And so that's number tax dollars that should be collected that should be going to fund public education, and it's not. And we're continuing to expand that, and so more people are getting these backdoor vouchers to go to private schools that aren't accountable to any of the state and federal, or very little of the state and federal regulations for education. Um, thank you, folks. I've got a couple of questions here on the environment. I'll sort of combine them. How will the legislature prevent power companies from, they have a little trouble reading, not a whole power uh, uh, station. The, it was sort of interesting. We interviewed uh, Winona uh, Baldenegro, uh, the Nali Baldenegro, and the next she said something about the power company. And the next week, we got a letter from the power company complaining about what she said. So <laughs> uh, we're a group, you know. So uh, our project is everywhere. Yes. <laughs> so, so they're listening into our little program. I mean, they got ears everywhere. Talking about the NSA. <laughs> uh, and put glasses on. So there's a question about the power plants in, in northern Arizona. And then uh, someone says, uh, thank you for being here today. I'm very concerned about water issues in particular, especially since our state fails to recognize the connection between groundwater and our aquifers and surface water, our rivers and streams. Such failure almost guaranteed that groundwater pumping will bring it oh, into yeah. rivers like the Verde River. It's a concern here in the valley, uh, folks. Um, this is the Verde Valley because of the Verde River. Uh, we're all here because of the Verde River. So power plants, water, <laughs> water usage. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> this is where I can be of the most information, I think. Um, well, I want to say that um, being Navajo, I just had, um, I'm coming from today, uh, my sister's Inimiway ceremony. And I, myself, my whole family, there's been hundreds of us out in Cameron. Um, doing a healing ceremony for my sister because um, she, like myself, is a veteran and we do a healing ceremony for our veterans. And it's very rare for a woman to have this ceremony um, because traditionally we were not considered um, to be warriors, but as, um, having served in the military, that's different. So I've spent the last three days with my hands um, working building fires, cooking for hundreds of people, hauling water in buckets, and um, butchering. I put, we butchered five sheep yesterday. And people don't know how hard it is to live in the desert when you have to do that. And yet in Cameron, I have about three interstate power lines buzzing above our heads while we labor in, in the hot sun. So. People don't know how hard it is to survive in our, in the United States, in Arizona, Northern Arizona, as a Native American. Native Americans are always considered papers, food stamps, welfare recipients. And yet, we're the one that is so generously allowing this overconsumption and, and the sense of entitlement, the sense of false reality. When you go down to the legislature, my uh, staff say, oh, Ms. Peshikai, you must be just so tired to be here working for the people. I say, oh, no, I like it, but I can turn on the light. <laughs> I have running water. If I need my computer, I ask my assistant or my page. That's a false reality in this, in this nation that we that it comes from nowhere. But there's a sacrifice, there is a cost to what, where that comes from. And the cost is the Native American people, my people, sitting out there 
with no power nor infrastructure in this century as the most highest population per capita of veterans. It's, it's mind-boggling. It, it, it can't even, I don't want to make people feel like they're, they're sad or they feel like I'm attacking them. But this is just the reality. This is just how it is. And so what I ask and what I hope when I bring the, myself down to the legislature to, to bring that voice of reality as a mother, as a, as a veteran, is that let's be fair. There's a cost, there's a, ha there's a sacrifice. No matter if you can make $100,000 a year and be able to pay that um, electric bill, someone else out there is paying for less electricity, maybe three or four times that amount in gas, fuel, um, batteries, cell phone. It's, it's, um, it's just a complete disconnect. I've sat in the energy committee meetings down in um, Phoenix at the legislature, SRP. SRP says, SRP, we are, we are committed to bringing cheap power and cheap water to the valley. And I sit there and I go, it's not cheap. That's, <laughs> that's the lifeblood of somebody, somebody's future. So that's all I want is a fair shake. So when you're talking about power, wattages, jobs, what folks are paying is just a drop in the bucket. And for 38 years, NGS has um, uh, been operating near Page, Glen Canyon Dam, all that. Mojave Generating Station has used pristine drinking water from the aquifer. Um, bringing coal, taking coal. There's been a cost, and um, they haven't really helped those folks transition. If I'm a, a Peabody worker, I've worked there 30, 40 years, and um, yet I didn't have the education as an employee for uh, retirement planning, investments. You're not transitioning those people that one day they're going to have to be not working, getting that salary, or or there's no transition to clean clean energy, clean power. There's no um, education in conservation and taking care of water. I mean, you go to the grocery store and you buy, um, I bought a copy of uh, National Geographic. Water is the new goal, and it's, it's bleeding out our ears here in Northern Arizona. And, um, and we're all in this together when it comes down to it. We're all in this together. And we need to come together and not, not be so set and stubborn not to give up and give something back to the community. And that's, that's all I ask of NGS, SRP, and I want the EPA to stick to their guns about this um, um, regulations. They can have some leeway, but I don't want to be living in a place where um, we have to wear a mask or um, we have to filter our water. I don't know. I don't know what the, the answer is, but I'm willing to come to the table and talk to people and really truly have in my heart and my spirit the, the fight to fight the good battle for for everybody, not just a few 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 people. And then also, we need to start really taking care of um, our groundwater and our aquifers. We just had this whole um, debate about storage tanks. Who who pays for their storage tanks? Is it um, you know, some gas stations, they come and go, and they leave the, gas, the storage tanks in the ground. Uh, we had this whole debate that I went through, and I can't remember. Um, I think it passed. I think the governor signed it. And so these are the kind of things that we all need to take a common sense approach to. And then let's see, what else? I'm getting really upset here. <laughs> That's what the heat does to you. <laughs> what storage? 
what do you what you said storage tanks? You talking about water storage? No, uh, the gasoline storage tanks. So like when a gas station ups and moves, and sometimes they don't take care of their water storage tanks and it contaminates. So um, I think on my ranting and rolling, I think I pretty much covered everything. But um, in GS. But um, I also want to urge the, the Navajo Nation to stick to their guns and asking for these amendments of NGS. <coughs> I think that it's time for NGS. <coughs> 38 years of a lot of, lot of money going out the window. If the lobbyists, and I know the lobbyists are <coughs> calling me and saying, yes, oh God. No, if the lobbyists can afford free meals on the lawn for the legislature, they can help those communities around NGS with a few of the little things that our kids need out there. So, anyway, thank you. That's not being discussed, but it's very delicious. I don't know what the leak is. Oh, oh, exactly. oh, the radiation. More yes, more. yes, yeah, yeah. I glow in the evening. <laughs> Anybody else have anything on water? I'd say, uh, uh, see, last time I visited some the Navajo folks on their plane, they had a series of, oh, they had a series of power line poles that came out to their house, but they had no power. They put the poles there. The poles are sitting right in front of their farm, and there's no power. There's no power lines. They never installed the power line. And this is the sort of situation, at least I see it. I just want to add uh, that we should all be very seriously concerned that there are really no water experts at the legislature, and part of that is a product of term limits, but um, it's really not an issue that yeah. anyone at the Capitol who's making policy about it really has a, a good grasp of, and so it, it should be concerning to all of us. Oh, and I just have a, one quick comment. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of what we're doing lately too is is reverting back to our old power sources when we should really be moving to more towards solar energy and renewable energies. And I think I think that you know, with Arizona being the sunniest uh, state in the nation, I don't understand why we don't have as much solar energy as, as say Germany and other places. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's one of those things. And then. In, in addition to that, well, I we think just lost the two John Grants off the Corporation Commission that were called the Solar Team. Yes, they both got voted out of office, and Angela wanted to mention that Brenda Barton is chair of the Water Resources Committee, oh, which oh, also explains wow. why we're not having any emphasis on water mm -hmm. issues. And that's that's actually what I was going to bring up. But I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I forgot that part about trees taking the water. Trees are taking the water. <laughs> I, yeah, there, there are a lot of amazing comments that are made at the legislature. I had to hear um, in Commerce Committee, uh, there was a, a special committee brought out just to explain how bad the EPA has been for the U.S. and how we should get rid of it entirely and uh, all of the reasons why it's been terrible. So um, I, could, I could go on and on about that, but uh, you know, I think that you have heard enough in the papers. Um, and then the other thing about water is, is it's, it's, you're right, I mean, water is so difficult here in, in Arizona. It's regulated by four or more different bodies. Um, you know, like you said, the groundwater versus you know, surface water, and then you have you know, CAP project and the federal government, and you have all these people trying to regulate this water. And we really need to simplify it and make sure that we aren't, aren't um, putting our water tables, filling them falsely. Uh, we're supposed to have it at 100 years, uh, but every time that they measure them, they falsely put in more water to make sure that it reaches the table it's supposed to be. Um, that is not that is not planning. And and in a, in a desert with a growing population, we need to be very concerned about the future of water in this in this state. So I think those are very important questions that you asked. Thank you. I have a question. I wonder um, if the legislator knows that they were Nippon Oil, like Japanese oil company executives that came to, to Arizona to negotiate with APS for uh, solar energy and what happened with that? I'm not familiar with that. They, they told me that they wanted to negotiate and see if they can do a joint venture with APS for solar energy. 
Okay, let's, uh, That's a great let's go talk. on to the next question. That's a great I thing to talk about afterwards. I think either. people heard what you had to say. It was um, great. I mean, in, in a lot of different lives. Mike. Right. Um, uh, I'll make a prime event with the legislators here and everybody here afterwards. I'm a, I'm a betting man. Brittany River, dry, 20 years. Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, let's, let me ask, I'm going to ask you one that you can ask me real quickly. Uh, 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 Chester Crandall, the senator from this district, uh, proposed some legislation about ignoring uh, a state law trumping federal law. Uh, the question is, uh, can we object or challenge the legislature's 2014 ballot question? Now, his law didn't go anywhere, but I believe he succeeded in getting it put on the ballot. Is that correct? Yes. The question is, can we object or challenge the legislature's 2014 ballot question to allow them to bar everyone, to, to bar uh, every um, enforcement of any federal law they don't like? Isn't this unconstitutional? Constitutional. If it is, how can we legitimately, legally stop it? I have a similar question, Mike, which is: uh, Will Will Arizona? Uh, will I can't read it. Put your glasses on. There's my glasses on. Why has Arizona not invoked the nullification as spoken of by Jefferson, Madison, and others? Seems to me we had a civil war about nullification. <laughs> All right, well, the, the first question about the, the Crandall bill, yes, uh, he did pass, he did get that through the legislature. Um, it has been referred to the ballot, so it will be on the ballot in the next election. So the question was, can we, can we keep that from happening? Um, yes, you can. You can refer that to the ballot, but it kind of doesn't make sense because it's already going to be on the ballot. Uh, so I, I think at this point, the it's best... The, the best uh, way to kill this bill, which, which I, I really think is, a, is, in my opinion, is a really ridiculous proposal, the best way to kill it is just to vote no at the ballot. Um, now, now this, this bill is more of a, it's more of a statement. Uh, and there, there are several um, legislators down there who try to make statements about states' rights, about the Tenth Amendment. And, and, and there, are, there are some legitimate statements, but there are some times where they do things like this, which just really don't make any sense whatsoever. This will result in nothing more than litigation. No. Uh, if this is adopted by the people at the ballot, there will be a legal challenge. You, the taxpayers, will have to fund the state of Arizona defending this, and the state of Arizona will lose. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's that simple. Uh, I, I sit on the rules committee in, in the House, and there's a rules committee in the Senate, and it's an interesting committee. The whole purpose of that committee is to do two things. Mm -hmm. One make sure that every piece of legislation is, is in proper order, proper form, make sure it's, it's written correctly. And two, determine is, is this constitutional or not? There are lawyers who are independent. They are, they are not beholden to one party or the other. They're purely constitutional lawyers who, who study these bills, and they come in and give us a report, and they tell us, yes, this bill is, is constitutional, if it were to be passed, or no, this is gonna have huge constitutional problems. This bill is clearly unconstitutional. Our lawyers told us that. Our lawyers tell us, the, tell us this about many, bi many bills that we've passed that have been challenged, that have been struck down. Um, it, it's, it's a shame because our body as a legislature, we ignore the advice of independent lawyers all the time, and we enact things just like this Crandall bill, which will ultimately cost the state of Arizona uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in taxpayer funds. Um, Mike, that was my question. I, I still would like to know why we can't stop it before we even go that far if it's unconstitutional. Is there any platform that can do that? Um, the, the, the only way that, that you can stop a bill once it's been passed is to do what's, what's called a, a, a referendum. And you would, what you'd have to do is you have to collect signatures from the community and you would put it on the ballot to have people vote about whether to disapprove of that law that we passed. But, but, but it doesn't make sense because this bill, all it does is send this issue to the voters. So it would really be accomplishing the same purpose. Okay. So really, no. Does the other side also have their own lawyers that say that it is legal and it is constitutional? They use the same lawyers. Is it? Oh, but to, 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 she asked if, if there are lawyers on both sides. And, and yes, there are. We have, as, as the Democrat caucus, we have our own lawyers. The Republican caucus has their own lawyers. But, uh, but the lawyers for the rules uh, committee are the official constitutional experts. Yeah. And those are the ones whose opinion we pay them to give us that advice about the Constitution. Yeah. They are, they're the ones who have litigated these issues in courts for many, many years. 
they're the ones who are experts on these issues. And, and even, even with that said, uh, most lawyers that, 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 that know about this issue, if they, uh, if they don't come out and say it's unconstitutional, they just they keep quiet because they don't want to come out and say that, they don't want to come out and defend it because they know how really ridiculous it is. So they, they just kept quiet. So, Mike, do you have another question? Yeah, I got another education question, if we can do that. Uh, uh, due to the states being funded primarily from land districts, some schools uh, offer much poorer facilities, supplies, salaries, and so on. What additional assistance can the state provide to create more equal lending, equal learning opportunities? Big difference in the state, you know, as you know, there's some districts are rich, some districts are poor. Right, and and uh, you know, as a state, what we have not done for many years is, is funded the school facilities board, uh, which is which is uh, an entity that is going to help districts build infrastructure, build the buildings that they need, keep roofs over our heads. I can tell you that a lot of our districts are really uh, uh, educating our kids in buildings that are that are dangerous, literally dangerous. They're, they're literally falling apart. I know the district where I serve in. Uh, in our in our district office, where our governing board table is, we had a presentation just a couple of months ago about the 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 ability of the building we were sitting in to really continue to be safe. And and, and as they're giving a presentation, he said, "Members, look around at the walls. You can see how they're crumbling. You can see sunlight coming through the walls. And we cannot we we can't afford to to improve them because the state hasn't funded this for for many many years. And our district is in good shape." There are many districts, especially in, part, in more of the rural parts of the state, that are suffering a lot, lot more than this. Um, what we have done this year, and I think what's a proposal that's on the books now, is to uh, increase school districts' bonding capacity. It would allow them to bond for, to ask the voters to, to, to bond for more money to enable to enable them to conduct some of these um, um, construction and, and and capital needs that they have whether it's building buildings, whether it's uh, replacing air conditioning units, putting in more carpeting, you know, doing things that, that the structural things that our districts need. Uh, I'm hoping that passes because we're not giving them any additional money. Um, so that will allow them to ask the voters to, to, to help, them, help them do that. And you're right, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, but but it's, it's the only option that we're giving them right now. So it's real disappointing. Again, we as a state, we need to refocus our priorities uh, in terms of education. Can I, can I just add, this is local, is that there is an override in no uh, November of this year. You'll be voting on the same thing. Uh, that's to get uh, to actually pass the override, which will allow us to go back to where we were as far as uh, our budget was concerned. We've had cuts, and they're going to hit next year. And they're going to hit our schools. They're going to hit Big Park. They're going to hit Middle. They're going to hit Red Rock High School. Again. This is Big Park again. Big Park Sedona. So you have a chance to vote in November. I first of all, I urge you, urge you all to vote if you're in the district, most of you are. And secondly, to support the override. We badly need it. The schools here are hurting. There's no music teacher here at uh, No, quickly, on the hand, it's, it's a horrible misnomer, the term override election. In any given time in Arizona, 80 to 90% of districts operate under an override. In other words, the schools, schools are so poorly funded that, that in order to uh, maintain the programs that they have, you have to uh, allow, you have to have this vote to allow what they call an override election. All it's going to do is maintain what the school is already spending, but it's going to allow them to, to spend a little over 10%, in most cases 5%, over their revenue control limit. That is the number, amount of money they get per student. Um, uh, and it, and it's, where the money comes from, it's, it's what's left of state support in education. That, that is the part that has dwindled so terribly and why uh, when it comes to local stuff, you know, your local taxes, property taxes, and that sort of thing. But the state support has, is what has been so devastating uh, and just pulled away. And what's left is, is, is inadequate local support. But I, I, I bristle every time I heard the word override when, when, when there's something, when, that's what they call it. Well, when there's something that 90%, 80%, 75% of the districts operate under all the time in order to, eat, to open their doors every day, I'm not sure override is a good term. Right. Um, but, uh, I have one more uh, question here, and it's an other question. 
And I think it's an interesting one. And it's, it's not so much about pieces of it. can't hear you. Turn your mic on, please. Put the mic in your mouth. Oh, the question is, please tell us a little bit about what it's like to be so few among a super majority. Do they still have a super majority? No, they don't. Does anyone want to address that? I mean, what's it like to be a Democrat surounded by crangles? Well, well, Katie's been there longer, so we might have different opinions. Um, she's a lot more patient than I am at this point, I'm sure. Um, but they don't have a super majority in the House. It's um, it's uh, 60 members. There's 24 of us, so we're only six away from having an equal number. Um, and in the in the Senate, we have 17 to 13. So it's even closer, which is is partly why we are actually having some reasonable. Um, piece of legislation that are going through, like Medicaid expansion, actually wouldn't have been wouldn't have been done had it not been for the amount of, of Democratic seats we earned. Uh, in addition to some of the Republicans who are willing to to hear that debate and really uh, support it, um, I'm I, I'm new this year, and so you know I've I've heard reports like you all. I've talked to legislators. They all talk about how frustrating it is. Um, it can be frustrating, uh, but I also think that we're, we're getting closer. I think that the, the population of the state, um, the population of the state is changing, uh, demographics are changing, and I think that we're going to be more blue in the future. And, yes. and, and we're all preparing for that, and we're all hoping for that, but in the meantime, we're working on the other side of the aisle in whichever way we can to make sure that the that the other side sees um, the reason in having competition mm -hmm. and making sure that, that all sides can look at an issue, that it matters to be able to be um, critical on both sides. You, you, you can't have, you can't operate um, without ever having any criticism when it comes to state law. This isn't just our, this, is, this, is, this decision that we make affects everybody in this state. This is, these are laws, we, we shouldn't be coming up to the legislature without ever having to think about what it is we're doing. And they often do because they take it for granted that they can get anything through. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that the return on investment for everything we do is is solid, that, that we have a good return on investment. That means I'm okay with tax cuts and tax credits as long as we get the jobs and the revenues and the, and the kind of things that we're looking for in return for those. Um, so, so I think that I'm emboldened personally. Um, it, it again can be frustrating, um, but we all have to share our own experiences and share information. And I think it's getting better. Oh, Representative Mock is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Me, on the other hand, when I go down to the legislature, I think, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So when the bill came to the house about um, using uh, different gold and silver for legal tender. I said, okay, I want to look in the mouth of every Republican and see whose teeth I can pull to pay my taxes. So, so I figure I can't reason with them. I'll just use their own strategy. <laughs> That's a Navajo way of doing things. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, but on the other hand, I do enjoy my colleagues, and um, especially the Democrats. I told my sister, I said, I really like this legislature thing because I'm serving with the best of the best in our state, and it's really a great honor. And um, I have to remember that when I listen to some of these bills from the Republicans. <laughs> Yeah, um, I echo what, what, what your colleague said. My, my experience is a little different as well because I sit on two very controversial committees, uh, the Judiciary Committee and the Government Committee, where a, a lot of the extremism that we've heard about happened in those committees. So every week I saw really something that was, that was really not representative of the greater state. It's a small minority uh, of, of extremists who are successfully pushing through their their extreme ideas, uh, and and they're very uh, uh, very blunt about it, and very bold about it. Uh, they want to shove it down our throats, basically. And so our input is is, is oftentimes 
uh, uh, completely disregarded, um, and, and, and it's difficult, it's difficult. But with that said, the numbers have changed, like, like Ms. Mott said. Uh, there are more Democrats, there are less Republicans this year, they still have a majority, um, but with that, that, since we're a little bit closer to being equal, it has forced us to work together on things. Yeah. Medicaid yeah. is... Yeah. Which, is, which is ultimately what makes for a better state of Arizona. Yeah. And Medicaid is the best example of that. The large majority of our state are supportive of Medicaid. They've approved it at the ballot for two times already. The large, so now, the majority of the legislature in the Senate, not too long ago, supported it. That, that's reflective of the state of Arizona. Democrats and Republicans working together for what's good for all of Arizona. And I, I do believe that's going to be in the House. Um, so with that, I, I, there are very, very frustrating times. There are very, very hopeful and very promising uh, things that happen as well. Um, so that's my experience. I know Katie's been here the longest out of all of us, so she'll have a, a different explanation. Yeah, can you give us two examples of those extreme views? Oh. Um, well, I, I, think, I think there are there are two that are, one I know is going to come up later. Uh, we'll talk about those voting issues. Uh, there are, I think, I think the 1070 issue, a lot yeah. of the anti-immigration issues were, were just huge, extremely divisive issues, uh, and a lot of the issues dealing with labor this year. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a large attack on the labor community and, and working, working families, uh, and that's been, that was, that's been a very controversial issue in the government committee this year that I've had to deal with. I just have uh, one comment on that. We, I sat in appropriations when the bathroom bill went through. And do you all know what the bathroom bill is? Do you know? Okay. So, so the bathroom bill, essentially, the first iteration of the, the bathroom bill uh, basically prevented anyone who appeared, whose gender presentation um, was, was opposite of what appeared on their uh, birth certificate. They could not go into a bathroom. So if you were born a male and you looked like a woman because you dressed like a woman, you would not be allowed to go into the men's bathroom or the women's bathroom. And, and so, so it was it was about sexual predators essentially. It was the underlying uh, bill. It changed uh, slightly to allow uh, bigotry. They allowed municipalities to um, to essentially have have people uh, discriminate without any retribution. There could be no suing over that. Um, so that, that was the second iteration. We heard hours of testimony from mostly transgender people talking about how it, was, it would endanger their lives. Endanger, they, would, they could die by going into the wrong bathroom, by being beaten up. Case after case, has, it has happened to their friends. They, they have known people who have been assaulted for this very reason. And they just want to, it's a biological imperative you have to use the bathroom. And so, 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 you. You're not an Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was a very, it was a very, you know, a <laughs> it was a very heated argument. And, and uh, what came out of hours and hours of just emotional testimony and complete bigotry was a straight party line vote. And the Republicans all voted for it, and the Democrats all voted against it. And that's the kind of extremism that we see on a daily basis that, that does leave me, I mean, I am hopeful for the future, but it, that night I went home really upset and very disappointed. And you know, those things happen on a daily basis in small ways, um, but you have, to, you have to know where you, you can go, and I do have a vision for where I'm going. So, yeah. Do you have something, I'll be quick. So when I was elected in 2010, um, the, the Democrats did have, a, I guess, a super minority. Is that the opposite of a super majority? Um, so, so I was in the, the 2040 split in the House, and it was so completely discouraging. I would stand, sometimes it felt like all we could do is stand up and kind of yell because it didn't matter what we said on the floor. Um, it, it wasn't going to change the vote, and we didn't have enough people on our side to kill really bad stuff. And I, in the in my first two years, in, in 2011, 2012, there was some really bad stuff in the legislature. So what? So everything's relative, and so we're still in the minority. But it, it's it's so much better than it was to the last two years. So we have enough people. Um, that will vote with us on some of the really key issues. We were able to kill 
um, the anti-union paycheck protection, and I put that in quotes, paycheck, paycheck protection bill in, in the Senate. Um, and there was about four versions of that bill floating around. And because we killed the one that came to the floor, those other bills all um, basically didn't come to the floor again. Um, we were able to pass Medicaid expansion, which going into this legislative session for me, um, that was my biggest priority. And that was before the governor said she was gonna support it. So that was a great, um, a, a, a great thing. But, and I think for most of my colleagues um, across the board that that was probably one of our biggest priorities. And, and we were able to make that happen. And that would not have happened two years ago. And so it's so much better. And the, I mean, we're still seeing some really bad stuff, but it's not as bad and not as much. And like one example is the, we saw the, the anti-Agenda 21. Are you all familiar with that? So Agenda 21 is this United Nations declaration. It's these 21 principles that talk about sustainability and anti-poverty and protecting the environment. And it's just like a set of principles. And um, the first President Bush signed those. It's not binding, it's not law, it's just a set of principles that we agree to. And so there's this, conspiracy theory, I guess. I don't know that Agenda 21 is bad and it's the communists and the United Nations trying to take over our country. And things like um, urban infill and bike paths and light rail are all part of this communist agenda. And so we had a bill um, that was debated at length um, in the government committee to basically say that Arizona couldn't adopt any laws that had anything to do with any of this, which would basically require every state department in every, in every jurisdiction, so all the cities too, to go through every single thing they do and make sure that it didn't have anything to do with any of these. And you know that you can imagine the ramifications of that would be very far-reaching. It would address, it would affect anti-poverty efforts, anything sustainable that's being done. So you know it's just stupid and it's just crazy to me that people believe this. And um, and this actually passed the Senate. I don't know if it passed the House, but I mean that's an example. And so those Republicans that vote with us on some of the really key issues. This Agenda 21 thing, it's bad, but it's not the worst thing that could happen, and it's kind of just stupid. I don't know if the governor will sign it, but I mean, that's the issue that some of the Republicans that vote with us, they're not really willing to kind of, um, because it's such a stupid issue, they're gonna vote with their party on it because it's not gonna really go anywhere. But, so in the scheme of things, it's not, it just makes us look stupid. It's fodder for the Daily Show, so. <laughs> This is in the same day. We got a question from someone that says, what do we do about the state legislator that's receiving a salary from a state tuition organization? How is this guy able to do this? How is he able to have these the, the charter school laws that he gets a piece of the action of the money that the, the, the charter schools get? Or explain it any, at the best way you can. You know, what, what this comes down to is an issue that, that brought me to the Capitol. It's about ethics in, in state government. And I introduced a bill this year that would have created an independent ethics commission to investigate every single element of, of unethical conduct by your elected officials. There is a lot of that happening. That's a perfect example of something that's just not appropriate. Uh, there are, there's a, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, campaign finance reform that needs to be done. It's, it hasn't happened this year. The majority just doesn't want to see it get done. There is, uh, we've had uh, members of the majority party who have gotten into trouble uh, and, and, and yet they're, they're not being held accountable for their actions. That's all happened uh, all, at all levels of government. It's not just at the legislature. Statewide officers, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, who have gotten in trouble and have not been held accountable. Uh, legislators who have gotten in trouble and not been held accountable. Eth ethics is a big problem at, at, the, at the state legislature, in, in state government. I can tell you that right now from experience. That's why I got appointed to office. And it's not just, and, and I, I say this you know, with all due respect, it's not just on one side of the aisle. It's on both sides. We all need to be have more ethical behavior. And that's the reason why I got there, because of the, my predecessor uh, had to resign his seat because he got, he got into some trouble. Mm -hmm. And, and that, it's a sad day when that becomes part of the norm, when that happens over and over and over again. Every year, we're seeing more and more people get into trouble. Uh, this is an issue that we need to work on. I'm going to continue to push it next year. And I'm going to continue to work on ways to reform all sorts of, of ethical issues at the Capitol. Um, as, as for this one in particular, well, what's happening here, and, and Kate, you might know better, yeah, what's happening here is he's kind of falling into 
what 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 is a, a big loophole in, in our laws in terms of, of being conflicted out of voting on certain things. And those are laws that need to be fixed. They need to be updated. They need to be changed so that that type of situation does not happen anymore. And it's happening because it, it, there's nothing stopping it right now. The same way that that uh, uh, you know, in terms of campaign finance, lots of people, as a matter of practice, violate the law because the only penalty is a couple hundred dollar fine, uh, and, and they can they can afford it. They just budget for it. I'm going to violate the law, and I'm going to pay this little fine. Everything's good. Everything's good. You know, and 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 it seems that the state of Arizona has lost lost uh, their memory seems to have slipped about why we enacted a lot of these issues in the first place. It was because of ad scam. Uh, and that's why we, we adopted a lot of uh, uh, campaign finance reforms. But since then, they have been loosened every year. Mm -hmm. And so now we're at a point where people can do almost whatever they want. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, real, it's a real problem. Uh, well, I would just add that the loophole that it's Senator, Senator Yarbrough is the, is the senator. And he runs the largest tuition tax credit organization in the, in the state. And he, um, at the beginning, when tax credits were first introduced, he sponsored most of the legislation. The, um, I believe the loophole is that if a law affects um, 10 or more people, um, and you're one of them, um, you're not conflicted out. Um, and so that's why you have teachers in the legislature that can vote on legislation that affects teachers, you have doctors, you have lawyers, because um, there's lots of people in those groups um, the number, I believe, should be much higher than 10, um, but there's more than 10 tuition tax credit organizations, and so Steve Yarbrough is safe in sponsoring and voting for that legislation and not conflicting himself out of it, um, which he could very easily, um, there's enough votes without him to pass that legislation, he could very easily just say, I have a conflict, I'm not voting on this, and then just get rid of any appearance of conflict. But not only does he not do that, he continues to sponsor the legislation and push it forward. So, so that's very um, unfortunate. And I know we tried to change the rules on the House floor a couple years ago to address that, and there's just not any interest in doing that. And you brought up campaign finance too, and I just wanna say really quick um, that we have really low campaign finance limits in Arizona. It's 400 and some dollars is the maximum contribution. The legislature and the, go the governor just signed a bill um, to uh, more than triple that. And so now, and, and like federal elections where you can give the maximum in the primary and then again the maximum in the general, um, they're going to apply those same limits across the board for every legislative office, every statewide office, and I am sure it affects city uh, local elections as well. And so we're not doing, we're, we're changing the laws, but we're not changing in a way that helps the perception of just um, uh, dishonesty and unethical behavior, it makes it worse. So what we've been talking about here is what, what we as legislators could do. Obviously we need to tighten the um, ethics rules, we need to make sure that we close the loopholes, we need to make sure that campaign finance gets taken care of. But the thing I want to stress is what you can do, which is that you can make, uh, make the people in, there, in that district aware of that fact by either donating, by volunteering, by making sure that, that the, there is campaign literature out there the next time that it rolls around that says, hey, he's making money off of the, the legislation he's passing. And those are the kind of things, that's what's going to change this legislature, is everybody in the state like you who, who are involved like today, just showing up and making yourselves aware of it. So that's the first step, but the second, third, and fourth are very important. And I really want to thank everyone who's already done that and encourage you to do more of it because these people definitely need to be targeted and taken out. Taken out in a conference. <laughs> I, I know this is a part and I know that that would be taken out of context. <laughs> I just want to uh, reiterate um, Stephanie's, uh, Representative Mott's words. Um, being from Northern Arizona, District 6, I know a lot of people in the area that were formerly district um, well, district two, you know. So there's a lot of people that call me up and say, James Sita, you're our new state representative. And I say, no, I'm not. <laughs> Check your ballot and look at who you're voting for. And they say, oh my gosh. So I think um, there's some delayed reaction to the response that I am now hearing after being in session um, 
almost six months uh, that people are calling me and they're shocked about um, being redistributed and having different representation now. So it's all about awareness and informing everybody because there's so many elected officials that overlap in jurisdiction and stuff. So people get confused and they become um, a little bit lazy and then, um, then they're caught in this kind of um, um, representation. We're supposed to be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a bunch of questions. We're running out of time, and these people who have written the questions have wonderful handwriting. Um, <laughs> uh, can you comment on the following moves by the state legislature uh, that, is, that have moved to restrict voting rights? And, and, and they detail two of them, and then I have another question. What's happening with clean elections? And then we have another question. It's all about restricting voters trying to cut down the vote. And so we have a bunch of questions about that. I, uh, we'll just batch them and maybe you guys can respond to, to that. Um, I sit on the um, the Senate Elections Committee, which is um, where a lot of the voter suppression bills originated. Um, I will comment that the um, clean elections bill that is moving is HCR 2026. Um, it's a Paul Boyer bill, and um, it will, if it passes, it will bypass the governor and move clean elections directly back to the ballot. And what it does is sets up, um, it doesn't remove the funding mechanism for clean elections, it just diverts it to education. So he's kind of setting up this, hey, we're not funding education so much, we should take this public money that funds clean elections and divert it to education instead. Which, and really, um, the legislators in the last session um, kind of made a deal with clean elections that they were going to make institute some reforms and then leave it alone and the business community who constantly attacks clean elections kind of agreed to this and so Boyer is really just kind of thumbing his nose at this agreement he's like well I wasn't here and I wasn't part of that um, and so he's I, I'm not sure I know that 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 bill passed the house and it came over to the Senate and it passed our committee and I'm not sure where it is and I kind of think it will die um, but I'm not positive about that. So watch for that. If it passes, it will end up on the ballot in 2014 if they're not successful in challenging it off. Um, and I know Martine has a lot to say about these voter suppression bills too, but essentially what they're trying to do is really change how Pebble um, permanent early voting works. And they're using the last election as kind of a, an excuse to say, oh, this is a huge mess, we have to clean this up. And there was all this you know, national news about how long it took to count the ballots in Arizona. Um, this actually wasn't the longest it's taken. Um, and I, for one, like it maybe sometimes to take a while because then we know that they're being counted right. And so what the elections officials, and I, I will say, I think that our elections officials have a lot of integrity and they do a really hard job well. Yes. When it comes to early voting, I think they have woefully failed in terms of education to the public yes. to understand better how early voting works mm -hmm. and how voters can make it easier on themselves. They need to do a lot more in terms of education and outreach on early voting to, to clear up a lot of the problems that happened with the last election. Because people have gotten to the habit of getting their voting, their ballot, taking their time to fill it out, and then turning it in on, on election day. And that's what caused a lot of the issues on election day. The other, so what they're trying to do is basically send you a card if you don't early vote, and then if you don't return the card, they'll take you off the permanent early voting list. And that's not good because people sign up for that and they and they expect to be on it. So the other issue is the um, is the collection and turning in of early ballots and a lot of groups that work with um, minority populations in tr in terms of, of registering and making sure that they're voting and getting their votes in, they're the groups that are collecting these ballots and um, and so they're being targeted um, it, this, it is a, a minority voting issue. They're, they're being targeted and saying, you can't turn in all the ballots you're turning in. Um, and um, so, so, so they're basically criminalizing anyone who turns in an early ballot that isn't their own. And if you're not a neighbor or a friend or somebody who has, the person has explicitly given permission, and I don't know how they're checking this. And actually, Helen Purcell, who's the county recorder for Maricopa County, or not the county recorder, uh, what she does elections in Maricopa County. She said in front of me, because I asked her about this, she said, 
basically that they don't intend to really enforce it, but what, they're, what they'll do is if they see somebody with a laundry basket full of ballots, they will, that's who they're gonna target. And that's the, the organizers, the activists that are collecting these large numbers of ballots. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem, especially in terms of a minority voting and my, minority turnout in elections. Oh, okay, so those bills have now all been amended because they there was a, a fight that is all politics and, and oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. so the, essentially all of those election bills are all rolled into one um, 2305 20, 2305 um, and uh, this was done in a conference committee with no um, testimony no public input after there has all, you know, there's clearly issues with these bills. Is that, they, all, is that ACR? Uh, no, ACR 2026 is the Clean Elections Bill. House Bill 2305 is the all of the other like voter suppression bills. That's a House Bill. The House Bill 2305. Um, and what the other thing with the 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 elections officials rushing to try to clean up this problem that happened with the last election. They didn't ever go to any of the groups that work on voter outreach, voter engagement, voter registration, and work with them and have them at the table to work on solutions together. They just rushed this legislation through. Um, and so if they're not actually trying to suppress the vote, um, then they could have at least included some of these groups at the table so that it doesn't look like they're trying to suppress the vote. They have more time. This doesn't have to be done this election or this session because we have another session, another legislative session before the next election. So we have time to work on some of these issues and to include more people at the table and so that it is a more, it's a better, a better answer. Um, these these voter bills are, are something that I've, one of the areas that I've been focusing on uh, almost exclusively this entire year. It's been a fight that's been going on from, the, from day one up until just last week when me and, me and Ms. Hobbs were on the, the conference committee. Um, so so let, let's, let's break it down. What is this really all about? What, what is the problem that we're trying to fix with these bills? This is what they've been saying. The problem are, the problem, there's several problems. They are one, there are early ballots out there that are not being returned. So the county is mailing early ballots out, they're not being turned in. Uh, or if they're not being mailed in, the people are taking them to the polls personally and dropping them off at the polls. Um, Ballots are being collected by volunteers, by, by community outreach organizers, assisting people, getting them involved, encouraging them to vote, telling them to vote, and then helping them turn in their ballots. Um, so, so those are kind of some of the problems. So what, what does that really mean? When you sum all of that up together, what's the problem? We got a lot of people voting. Yeah. Last time I checked, I didn't know that was a problem. You know, that, should, that should be something that we're celebrating. Yes. So not only are there a lot of, so, so this is the reality of the situation, not only are there a lot of people voting, there are a lot of Democrats voting. And that's really what this is all about. The, the, the community organizers that are going out there and assisting their, 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 their communities to encourage them to vote and collect their ballots, they've been coming from a lot of Latino neighborhoods in, in Central Phoenix, West Phoenix, and, and in my neighborhood. So these are Latino voters who typically vote Democrat, uh, but not always, they typically do and they've been encouraged to participate in the electoral process. And that's a problem in Arizona. We don't want people voting, right? So, so, so the, given that that's the problem, what is the solution that they've proposed? Well, if there's too many people voting, let's limit the number of people that are voting. That's, that's the solution. Instead of fixing it, instead of finding ways to, to encourage more voters, instead of finding ways to shorten the lines, to, to get more staff out there, to, to uh, uh, better educate voters on how to submit their ballots. We're just gonna take people off of the list altogether. We're gonna limit the number of voters. That's the solution. And, and it, ladies and gentlemen, it, I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm the only one saying this, that's the wrong mindset that we're having, that we should be having here. We should be encouraging people, we should be engaging in education programs, telling them what's the best way to vote, telling them why it's not a bad thing that, it, that there's gonna be a long line at the poll and or a long wait for the final counts to come in. Tell them that this is a good thing. That's Those long lines are happening because there's a lot of people voting, a lot of people making our state a better place. So, thank you. So, what are some of the, what are some of the problems that are gonna come as a result of this? Because there are a lot of them. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to remind everyone, 
The state of Arizona is a Section 5 state of the, of the uh, Voting Rights Act. What that means is that our state has a history of doing exactly this. Mm -hmm. uh, just like Mississippi, just like Alabama. Exactly. Yeah. North Carolina. Exactly. Targeting minority voters mm -hmm. and, and, and placing barriers in front of their right to get to the poll. So what happened, disenfranchising voters, exactly, you said it. So what happens is because we're a Section 5 state, whenever we change laws that have to do with the elections or voting in the state, we have to submit it to the Department of Justice so that they can pre-clear it. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen after these bills get signed into law, which I hope they don't, I'm hoping the governor has sense enough to veto these, yeah. this will be sent to the Department of Justice and they are going to reject it, just like they've rejected similar bills in several years past. If they don't reject it, if for some reason it gets past the Department of Justice, there will be lawsuits again filed. Mm -hmm. Again, something the rules attorneys remind us is about several times this year. There will be lawsuits filed and we will ultimately lose. We, we will be able to file a lawsuit under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and really strike these laws down. Again, costing the, you, the taxpayers, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in taxpayer money to defend these lawsuits which are ultimately going to go down. So that, that's, that, that's the timeline of how this is going to work from this point forward. We're working hard to kill these bills. I'm not sure we have the votes yet. We know that there, there have been some uh, Republicans who, who come from uh, some rural areas who, who understand that there are uh, disabled voters, there are uh, elderly voters who need help from community organizers, helping them vote, helping them turn in their early ballots. And they understand that this is a problem because it doesn't just affect Democrats, it affects all voters, any voter. Uh, so I think that there are some that might be able to be persuaded to, to help vote against this, but I don't know for sure, and, and we're still going to find out at the end of next week, I think. Thank you. Um, I used to work for Coconino County Elections Office, and I was there less than a year before I decided to run. But anyway, one of the things that is not glaringly obvious is in the state of Arizona, we have 22 tribal nations. 22 tribes and so when you start talking about voter changes then people get confused about which election office there the changes are going to happen what is going to be the new laws you saw that with um, precinct changes and that type of thing so it becomes very confusing and this does disenfranchise um, the elderly uh, the people that maybe English is not their first language, and for tribal indigenous people, that's them. And also um, renters, people that have to have a post office, if you're renting, like if you're a student, then you're gonna be renting. So if your um, early, early ballot doesn't get back in the mail, then you're just simply purged. And that happens at tribal nations too. The Navajo Nation is doing a purge of their early, early voters too. So it can um, be a double whammy for voters on many different um, uh, jurisdictions and different levels. So just to let you know. There are also other things outside of people's control. Uh, for instance, we have a, a, a mailing center, a post office mailing center that is due to close in Tucson which means that um, all of our mail is going to have to be rerouted up to Phoenix and then back down, even if it's from Tucson. Um, so, so we're going to have, it could take days and days after um, you turn in your ballot thinking that it would go directly to an office. Um, and that, that's the same with the, the Tejon Odom tribe that I've talked to. They have that same issue. Um, not every area in, in Arizona has a mailing center that, that can allow them to turn it in or at least ensure that they're turning it on time. And, and so that's another issue that we faced down in Southern Arizona. But ultimately what it comes down to is, I'm willing to wait two weeks or however long it takes to, to see true results from an actual democracy. And, and, if, and, and yeah. <laughs> democracy depends on the, the voice of the people. And if we silence that voice by creating actual barriers, to their ability to express their vote, which is the most important part of living in a democracy, then we are not we are we are not a democracy. We are not a true one. So I think that ultimately these bills are very important, and we do need to ensure that that everyone has a voice and that um, that is more important than the time it takes. 
ultimately. And if, if we need to put a little bit more money or make it more efficient somehow, then we'll figure those things out. But these aren't the solutions that we're looking for. Uh, yeah, I've worked the polls, and, and the lines uh, in 2012 are nothing compared to the other uh, years because of the permanent early voting list. Uh, the Avapai County uh, has just been going up and up and up every year. I think last year it was 66%, and, and uh, year before that it was 60%. It's, it's an increasing voter turnout, and the Republicans are panicking over that because if you increase voters to turnout, you're going to just elect more Democrats, and that's simply the whole story here. All right, I think uh, uh, we have had uh, a, um, a lot of questions that were duplicated. If, you, if your question didn't come up, it, it we think it was answered by another question. If it wasn't, some of these people, maybe not all of them, and some of them will be around after we break up, and you can certainly uh, uh, call them and talk to them. They are going to leave their contact information, Stephanie tells me, and and, uh, and besides, we know where to find them. And most of us, can, we know where the capital of the state is, uh, even without uh, geography in Arizona schools. Uh, <laughs> Liam, are we going to do another question, or are we done? I, I think. Uh, do questions from the floor? Yeah. If, if you have some questions, you want to let them do a few. We've done as many questions we can. We've had spectacular answers. And, 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 and your answers are really illuminating and interesting, and I, I can inform you that I, I, I know that we're all very, very impressed with the quality of, of, of some of the.